the Fantasy Edge with Jonathan Chan, Kevin Quo, Richard Seville. Hello everyone and welcome to the Fantasy Edge. Uh, as always, we'll try to we'll do two things with our uh, with our football. Help you win your league and force Josh Gordon into conversation at all times. Uh, my name is Jonathan Chen, joined as always by my co-hosts uh, Richard Seville and Kevin Wo. How's it going guys? Hey, football might be happening. Keyword might. Yeah. Kev, what are the odds on that one? We're just gonna we're gonna pretend it's happening and we're gonna just overlook the impending doom that's coming. Because if football season gets cancelled, I'm not sure how I'm gonna cope. I think it's gonna be a really I think it's gonna be a weird season. I think we're gonna have a similar thing like baseball where there's going to be team won't be able to play this week or or game is suspended, which kinda screws up everybody's for um redraft fantasies, but I it's even bad for uh FanDuel um, I think we can have we can have a really screwy schedule, you know, where they play games on oddball days, like oh, we'll have to play this game on a Wednesday or something like that. And it could it could be some, you know, they may reschedule things in a, in a weird way. I think anything can happen. Any, everything is up in the air with it. Uh, I mean, at this point, the NFL's had well, they will have had seven months to kind of figure out, you know, what to do with their season. And to this point, the it, all indications have been that they don't really care and they're going to go you know, uh, act as if everything's normal and it will come back and bite them. I can almost guarantee something's going to go terribly wrong. Well, it happened with baseball, right? They had, it seemed like they had everything sort of, they had all the ducks in a row and then then just weird stuff started happening. It started with the Marlins, right? And Baseball's then, plan was go as normal and hope for the best. And, you know, the Marlins went to a club and the Cardinals went to a casino and a couple of the Cleveland pitchers went to a bar. You... If you're counting on players to kind of uphold these rules without really anything to keep them in check, they're not going to do it. And then your game's canceled. And in the NFL with the 16 game schedule, doesn't really work if you can if you have to start postponing games because you can't exactly play double headers in football. Yeah. I think the one thing they did though is they had that like variable schedule where like they can move games if they have to be delayed or postponed or something like that. I mean, I think the one question, the one thing that really like, I think Philip Rivers made this point on the conference call. It's like, what if the quarterback gets COVID right before the Super Bowl? Like, you're just going to hold him out? Because, yeah. that I mean, that's what it is. It's like, you know, what if Tom Brady gets test positive for COVID Saturday night before, you know, week 16 division game to win the division? Like, what are you going to do? You're going to make, I don't even know who their backup is, whoever it is. They're going to make them play. So, I don't know. It's going to be weird. But, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully they figure it out. Yeah, it's it's the broader picture too. Um, it's like, what about television? What if uh, somebody in the crew has the has virus too? You know, what games are we going to be able to see? And like, are our games going to be broadcast? Are we going to see all the games? Um, are we going to have full crews for these football games? Like, are we going to have like you know the high definition replays on every angle? You know, for a replay and stuff like that. Are we going to have all that stuff? You know, a lot of uh, you know, it's it's amazing the number of people that go into uh, putting together a football broadcast. It's just unbelievable. I was reading a thing um, a number of years ago, and I can imagine it's even a lot more now than it was then. Like about five, this was about five or six years ago. About all the things that go into make, putting a football um, bro- broadcast together. It's just blows you away. You know, the Sunday night football is like tons and tons of people. You little things you don't even think about. You know, so it's. Well, speaking of the broadcast, just recently we had the Big Ten and Pac-12 cancel their football seasons. Now, without a ton of football on Saturday, and theoretically the rest of college football is not going to have their season as well. Does the NFL start moving games to Saturday and Friday, kind of spread out those games and make sure that one, that all the games can get broadcast and two, there's less chance of kind of schedule overlap and make sure everybody can uh, can kind of, you know, have their own time at the stadium and travel time to keep everybody safe. Is that uh, you guys think that's going to be an option or are they going to plow ahead with owning their Sunday? Gee, that's a good question. Kev, I'll, you can take that one. I mean, I think they'll definitely take Saturdays. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't, I've, I've read that, like, you know, they, maybe they'll take Fridays. Maybe they'll take, they'll add extra games on Thursdays. But I think logistically that just, that makes it a little tough because then you'll have, you know, variable times of rest in between games, week to week. Like, not, 
if every team plays, if a team plays on Sunday, they plays on Saturday, then that's one less day of rest than a team playing on Sunday than playing on Sunday again. Mm-hmm. So I think if you start Saturday, one day might be okay. But if you start going into Friday, Wednesday, whatever, that, that kind of skews it too much. But I, I mean, I would definitely expect them to take advantage of, you know, open Saturdays and play games on those days. I mean, why not? Yeah. And r- referees too, they, they're, uh, in the thing, they'll be wearing masks. They're they're the only ones that'll be wearing masks apparently. So football players on the field, they won't have masks, close contact, and all this sort of thing. <sighs> now, I guess the season is scheduled to start. The first game is September 10th. This Chiefs Texans uh, as a preseason game. Do you see the NFL, uh, Richard? I guess making any changes uh, or I guess any any amendments to how they're going to do things before September 10th, or they're just going to kind of plow ahead? Well, we've seen a lot of stuff already changing already as we're going along. Like, they didn't even settle on um, uh, the opt-out date until just uh, last week. So this t- kind of tells me that they're kind of uh, taking it as, as baseball is. They're just going to uh, run with it and uh, fix it as it goes along. All right, and just one last thing, but I guess, before we get to the news. Uh, one more doomy thing. Uh, I'll start with Kevin. How many games do you think the NFL gets through before things just completely go to hell? Uh, let me count. One, two, three, four, 19 games. Okay. Because I don't think the NFL is going to cancel by like, like there's just, there's too much money involved. The owners have shown time and time again that they care more about money than politics and, you know, anything else in the NFL, even player safety. So I think as long as there are like, it's not like a, a complete breakdown of the system where like every single star player gets held out. I think they'll be okay, and I think they're going to play it through, and we will have a Super Bowl champion this year. Okay, hypothetically then, say uh, the O-line for Tampa. Like, they're playing a game, and then one person on Tampa's O-line gets sick. All five of them have to now sit out a game. Because of this, Brady then, Brady sits out a game due to players' safety. Does the NFL then do something about that? Nope. I think that's just something you got to do. It's going to be like a, whoever wins the Super Bowl is just they're going to have an asterisk on the season. That's just how it is. I think they're just going to deal with it however they have to deal with it, you know. Yeah, pract- I think they're going to go in with like bigger practice squads and bigger like bigger rosters in general, just so you have more flexibility with the COVID thing. Um, you know, whether players want to sit out or, you know, coaches want to essentially tank games because they're not having it. Like in that situation where Brady doesn't have like a starting offensive line, like this is, is what it is. Like, I don't think they're going to be able to cancel games just because I mean, I don't know how baseball is doing. I don't really follow that, but. I guess baseball and baseball players are more replaceable, but well, I mean, at, at this point, the St. Louis Cardinals—they've played six games of their of their fifteen game schedule due to postponements and all that. So mm-hmm. you can't really do that in football. So I, I tend to agree with you. I think they'll just have you know straight up practice squads playing before they cancel a game. Richard, what do you think? Uh, yeah, they'll go into they'll go into practice practice squads. You know, one thing about football is that we're always getting the unexpected, like the big stunner last year before the season even started was Andrew Luck retiring just like about what like two weeks before the season started or something like that and you want unexpected you're gonna get you we're gonna get unexpected things that we things that we can't even think about right now are gonna come up i mean we're we're speculating on a lot of stuff but we're probably gonna miss out on uh we're probably missing out on a million different things that are going to happen. I never saw that coming. And, with you know, like Andrew Luck, right? You never saw that coming. You were going to get a lot of never saw that coming uh, this year. For sure. All right. Let's uh, let's get into the news, get into the uh, the fantasy game stuff. Uh, well, I guess, again, some sour news coming out of Washington. Uh, Darius Geis was arrested uh, for domestic violence and then very quickly cut uh, within a couple of hours. Now everybody's all about the, uh, the Antonio Gibson train. Uh, but Adrian Peterson's still sticking around. Uh, Kevin, are you are, are you a Gibson guy now, or are you sticking with the uh, with old reliable in Washington? Um, I'm tending to st- stay away, but if I had to, I'd grab to get Gibson late. Like he's going, like his ADP is just skyrocketing to a point where I don't want him. But if I can get him late enough, like he's intriguing enough of a running back, he has the physical abilities. I mean, not that Adrian Peterson doesn't, but I mean, Gibson's much younger, and that's a young team that's I don't really think ready to contribute or compete for a Super Bowl this year. So I think they would, or I hope they would try to find what kind of you know young talent they have on the team that they can theoretically surround Dwayne Haskins with. Uh, so I, I mean, he's worth a flyer, but do I think like he's gonna be an RB, you know, a startable RB? Probably not, because like you said, Adrian Peterson is still there and and he's going to turn into the new Frank Gore and just 800 yards on 4.1 yards per carry. Uh Richard, um same question. Are you sticking with uh sticking with Peterson or you going with Gibson? 
Uh, I like Gibson, but this is the this is the thing, and Kevin's right about the inflation of the of the ADP for him. It might be getting a little too high. I'm I think of uh, Gibson right now as it stands. Um, and he's getting a similar hype. Uh, I don't know if you remember, there was a bit of hype around Tavon Austin when he was coming into the season. I kind of view Gibson kind of like Tavon Austin uh, back in the day. Uh, he's he's that kind of running back. He's more of a he's more of a pass catching running back. Um, you know, there's, and and so I think he could disappoint people where he's more of a quote unquote real football asset than a um, than somebody you really want in fantasy. That said, um, you want to have him. You still want to have him on your roster just in case because Ron Rivera. Um, if you look at Christian McCaffrey, Christian McCaffrey uh, to me is kind of an RBWR, right? So. Um, I think if if they manage to uh, get Gibson um, more of a running back feel in in the in the pros, uh, it could work out for him. I mean, I've watched the tape on him; the guy's awesome. Uh, but um, but the pros are the pros, and the college is college. And oh, um, I um, I I think you don't want to take him too high, but um, you're gonna feel kind of like a donkey if you don't at least keep him uh, put him on your target list, but. Uh, just don't uh, just don't go out and reach for him, uh, and uh, I think you'd be all right. But uh, there's another guy on the team too that that uh, kind of interests me. Bryce Love has been getting some uh, interest as well as uh, Adrian Peterson as well. So he's a guy to keep uh, on your watch list as well at this moment in time. Well, both Peterson and Gibson, Fantasy Pros has them at RB47 and RB49 and half PPR, which at that point, either is a good option. They're going behind guys like Zach Moss and or like around Tony Pollard, Boston Scott. So uh, that's handcuff prices for somebody that, or for two players that could be starting, which is good value now. Of course, like Kevin, like you said, uh, both their ADPs are going to go up over the next few weeks as we move toward the season. But for drafting early, uh, some good prices for both uh, Washington running backs. Yes, the Washington team. Running yes, backs. the Washington football team running backs. Yes. Uh, anybody another... have a pick for which topic next? I can... uh, we can do Damien Williams opting out. That's, All a right. big one. That's probably the biggest fantasy news of the offseason so far. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you go ahead and yeah, dive on that one. Yeah, Damien Williams opting out was kind of came out of nowhere. Although, I guess if you know, if you knew his health history, his family history, then, then maybe you could have predicted it. But um, just, I wonder if. The Chiefs kind of had an, a feeling that he might, which is why they drafted him first round because, or Clyde Edwards Hilaire first round. Because at the time, I was thinking like the Chiefs have a lot of holes that first round running back doesn't necessarily fill. Like if they can get production from Damian Williams, like I get it, C- C- uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is amazing, but couldn't you have like got a third or fourth round running back unless you knew maybe Damian Williams might opt out? So you really needed to fill that hole. I don't know. Conspiracy theory is just spinning in my head. The guy to get. I do like that theory, though. The guy to get, though, I think uh, is is. I think you should keep your eye on DeAndre Washington. I thought you were going to say Darwin Thompson again. Uh, well, <laughs> have this, that, have this whole conversation there's, there's, again. There's no training camp, and uh, <laughs> Darwin Thompson. Um, I, I don't know about him. He's uh, he's. You know he showed up really well in the in the preseason, but we've got no preseason to do any evaluation. But the uh, most experienced running back on the Chiefs is DeAndre Washington now. So I would I would definitely I've got my feelers out for this guy. Uh, my fantasy spider senses is is uh, is tingling over that guy. So keep your uh, I would keep him uh, on your uh, late list because he'll be available. And he might have value. So, did you guys know that he played at Texas Tech with Mahomes, Washington? Yeah, I did not know that. Didn't know either. But yeah. that's funny. And and they made it like a, he was like one of the Chiefs' like immediate signings in free agents. I, Again, it seems like they knew Damian Williams might opt yeah. out. I think Washington's just another guy, really. Like if he even even in the Chiefs' system, I don't see him being like. Oh, this is yeah, at the end of your draft. Producer, but as, as a spec ad, of course, it makes it makes sense. Um, speaking of Edwards Hilaire, his, uh, since Damian Williams opted out, his ADP is off the charts. Uh, it's getting to what are people doing territory. I've seen him go third overall. I've seen talk of second uh, ahead of Saquon. And it's kind of breaking my brain. Uh, people thinking about doing this with a rookie running back, even with Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. Uh, I guess, Kev, how high are you willing to to draft him at this point i am looking at my rankings because i'm unprepared but i believe i have him 12th overall 
Nope, much lower than that. I have him 14th overall. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he's a rookie running back, but like you said, DeAndre Washington, Darwin Thompson, those are just dudes. So you just kind of have to trust the Andy Reid system. You have to trust the Kansas City Chiefs offense. The touchdown upside is there. The yardage is there. The catches are going to be there. And if you just assume that they know what they're doing and that Andy Reid is a good talent evaluator and he sees like Brian Westbrook in this guy, then you just have to assume that he's going to be used like that. Um, would I be willing to take him that high? Like three, four, nine or whatever you've been seeing? Absolutely not. But I get the logic. And Richard, same for you. How, how early are you willing to take a CEH? Um, I have him as RB7 and overall uh, um, ninth. Um, I would take him ninth in the draft. Uh, based on spec, and just like Kevin says, because DeAndre Washington and Darwin Tosman are, are just guys, and Daryl Williams, if he gets back in there, so you're, I mean, it's, um, you, it's kind of hard not to pass him by because of the offense, as Kev says, so it, you really got to, uh, you know, fantasy football is all about taking chances, and I don't really think it is big, uh, that big of a chance. Clyde Edwards Hilaire, well, I mean, we, we saw what he did in the national championship. He, it was all out there for all to see. He was great, and so we know what he can do. So, I, and probably Andy Reid knows what he can do. So, uh, it's just uh, it's a great product out of LSU. There's nothing else to say. All right, Richard, sticking with you, we have a couple of uh, free agent signings, uh, free agent running back signings uh, that have muddied some backfields, both the AFC and NFC. Why don't you take your pick and uh, let us know about it? Well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take the shady to Tampa Bay one because uh, this this one sort of come up in the news now. Keishon Vaughn was in the COVID um, IR or whatever it is, and he's out of it now. He's, he's, he's ready to play, but they still brought in shady. So, um it's uh, Bruce Arians. I I think I I really don't know how Bruce Arians. This this offense is so weird now because you got Brady and and Gronk in there and I, I and and Shady's in there. I really don't know. This team is uh, it's kind of hard to figure out now. And Shady is kind of like Shady is kind of like a, a Frank Gore type now. Uh, he's he's. <laughs> He's a fantasy player you just don't want to come to your team, kind of like the Chiefs last year. He just didn't want to see Shady there because he just uh, he eats into anything that that uh, uh, Ronald Jones or Keishon Vaughn might might do. But um, I have a feeling that it you know Shady is. I mean, he still shows that he has wheels. But although at the end of the season, near the end of the season, the the you know he started getting wearing down, so that he was. You know, um, getting getting banged up, and so it might be the younger guys that, that take over in the long run. But the fact that he's there creates a lot of problems. And I know uh, Arian says uh, Ronald Jones is the guy, but uh, we'll have to see. But uh, I would keep a. You got to definitely kind of. Um, you kind of have to target Keishon Vaughn as well, just in case, and uh, Shady. But I think the cuff. I think the cuff is probably Shady. But uh, I don't know. It's a it's a really tough backfield now. But uh, Shady spoils the party. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, like Richard said, uh, Bruce Arians uh, came out and said that Ronald Jones is his main guy, and that uh, Vaughn and Shady are fighting for roles behind him. Uh, it's tough to kind of interpret coach speak, but with him coming out saying that, does Ronald Jones still take a dip in your in your rankings, or uh, are you taking him at his word and thinking that Jones is going to be the uh, the uh, the main guy there? the majority of the carries yeah i'm not taking arians at his word because he's a uh, perpetual liar like i think a couple years ago he was like oh yeah andre ellington is gonna have a huge role and people drafted him like second round and he didn't do anything and then they brought in Chris johnson and he was like oh my god this guy is still cj2k and for like 3.8 yards per carry so i don't know what the hell arians does with his running backs i don't really care what he says i kind of just choose to ignore it but i've been team rojo for like i think me and presto have yep. been on that train for a while so I mean, it just, it, it doesn't make, I, I get Keyshawn Vaughn is like, what was he, like a fourth round big, talented guy, whatever. Ronald Jones is not that bad. Like, I get that he's not a good pass blocker, but he was, if you look at his statistics, if you look at his yards per carry, if you look at his elusiveness, breakaway rate, all that stuff is like upper half of the league as far as running backs. Like, he's not bad. Yeah, but he couldn't beat out Peyton Barber clean for the job. Right, but, but I, like, it's not that he couldn't beat out Peyton Barber clean, it's that they, they split a role. Well, that's fine. Like, he was a rookie or a second-year player. Like, it, it happens, especially when you're playing with James Winston and you have to come from behind all the time. Like, yeah. he's not necessarily your prototypical pass-catching guy, but he can do it. 
I think Jones is probably just as talented as Vaughn, so I don't really see why there's people. It seems like people just don't really like Jones, so they wanted to see who the next guy is. But as far as I'm concerned, Jones is still the guy. Yeah, but you got to admit, Shady is a fly in the ointment. I could care less. The guy got a DNP in a Super Bowl. Oh. Well, on the on, on the other half of that coin, with uh, with Brady now as the the Bucks QB, you have to think that if you're struggling in pass protection like like Jones has, is he get does he get a quick benching if you know Brady gets hit a couple of times in the first game, uh, and then you go to the best pass blocker or the most experienced one, which would be Shady? Is that uh, likely in your mind, Kevin? I mean, it's something that you have to consider, but it, it's this. I mean, we've seen it with Pat's running backs, like this whole this whole Brady era. Like, it's just they're gonna play roles. They're gonna some games they're gonna be used more than in other games. Some situations they're gonna be used more than other situations, but they usually just have like Sonny Michelle has been the guy. Legarrette McPhil- Legarrette Blunt has been quote unquote guy. Um, I don't know. You know the guys better than I do, but there's always like the main running back and then there's the receiving well, there's the like, main running back and then there's james white correct but like my my whole thing is like just because ronald jones is not going to be the receiving back doesn't mean he's automatically not the main running back and the main running back in a brady offense typically has value definitely and richard uh shady's already come out and said that he's spoken with Deion lewis and he's going to speak with james white about being a receiving back in a tom brady offense Are you taking any <laughs> you taking that to heart do you think shady's going to be the uh the the new james white of the uh the bucks offense no no, he won't. He won't. He won't be uh, because he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't really with the Chiefs. Um, uh, they, they they kind of mixed and matched. And I, th- I have a feeling that uh, Aaron's will probably work him a lot in the similar way that they did with uh, uh, when he was uh, with uh, uh, Andy Reid. So I'm not saying that Andy Reid and they're totally two different type of coaches, Reid and Aaron's. But um, mm-hmm. the fact that you're bringing in. Uh, shady uh, and being a pass catcher. I, just, I don't know. It just, it's very un Arians like to do something like that. I think um, I think Arians would, would probably because uh, and it, and it's very un Brady like because I have a feeling that that Brady will kind of be the on field offensive coordinator. He'll kind of call the shots of how he uh, chooses to uh, run things. So. Uh, I, I, mean, I will chime in and say, like, well, one, for what it's worth, LaShawn McCoy said Ronald Jones is the guy and everyone else is behind him. I don't really know what that means. But uh, the other thing is I'm more willing to gamble on, uh, what's his name, Dario Gumbawale than LaShawn McCoy. Like, I don't even think LaShawn McCoy might make the roster. Like, I think he's just a guy that they just brought in just to see what he has left. I think Dario Gumbawale is pretty good as a third down guy. He was okay last year in that role. He's been practicing with Brady. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. That's a good point. That's a good point, actually. I think it's I think it's more likely that he has a role than Kishan Vaughn has a role. Because the one thing that people, I think, maybe aren't talking about enough when people are on the COVID list is they can't work out. You literally can't do any physical activity for forever long. You're recording. Like, sure, you could do, like, some, I don't know, some push-ups. You can go jog or whatever. But you can't, like, work out, work out. You can't go catch pass with Brady. You can't go to team meeting. You can't do any of that. So, as a rookie, he's already falling behind. On top of that, he is a rookie. Um, and as much as we like to, you know, denigrate Ron Jones' ability to pass block a lot of that is because he's a young running back. So, I don't really know why Keyshawn Vaughn would be any better at it. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, well, moving on. Uh, well, speaking of running backs that might not make a roster, uh, the Pats made an, another surprising signing uh, this week. Uh, Lamar Miller, who missed last season after a torn ACL, uh, signed to the Patriots roster, will now compete with Sony Michelle, Damian Harris uh, for uh, probably an early down role. Uh, Richard, does Lamar Miller make the roster? And how far down are you bumping Sony Michelle? Uh, <laughs> I'm not bumping down Sony Michelle very much at all. Uh, roughly, roughly about the same. I, I'll, uh, how many, how many running backs are on the pass now? You got, you, you didn't mention Brandon Bolden or Rex Burkhead. Mm-hmm. Brandon either. Bolden opted out, uh, and Burkhead's always been. You, you can't account for Burkhead. One game he'll have like 15 touches, and the next he'll have one, and then fumble, and then you, you, you can never count him. So you just keep him out of the equation. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, but uh, I, you know what? As every year, I try to stay away from the Pats' backfield, except for White. I think White's about the only reliable uh, fantasy uh, player you can pick up. But even he doesn't uh, produce on a consistent basis, mainly because uh, Belichick mix and you know mixes things up. But I, I don't know. And and then there's the Cam Newton factor. 
how does uh, how does Belichick work uh, work with Cam Newton in in the with the Pats? So um, I think it's a good fit. I think I think uh, I think the Pats getting Cam Newton is is a pretty good is pretty good actually because if if Cam Newton, although I will say that his arm was showing some, he was making some pretty bad passes before he was uh, before he left the field, and he wasn't looking that great. And the uh, Panthers weren't that keen to just you know keep him you know he didn't he didn't stick with the franchise he just they just let him they let him slide so you have to wonder about uh whether whether uh the pats are going to go, into go full run because because obviously if if cam newton can't run anymore which was his big thing when he was younger you know he was kind of like how russell russell wilson was when he was younger he was he was running all over the place now he's not running so well, but now he hasn't his arm isn't that great so yeah so they might have to rely on the running game. It's hard to say, but I don't. Uh, it could be Lamar Miller to me is kind of like Shady in a way. You know, he's just that that veteran presence. And uh, I know uh, I think I really feel for the Harris people. That's the guy who actually goes down in my books. I don't think Sony Michelle goes down, but it's actually uh, Harris for me. Uh, people, especially people in Dynasty who have Harris, uh, they they took. A, I think he takes a hit. Kev, same question. Does Lamar Miller make the roster? And if yes, uh, what do you do with him? I just I don't understand the signing at all, to be honest. I mean, their backfield is pretty set as far as I'm concerned. Unless uh, did Sonny Michelle have offseason surgery again? He did. He had foot surgery. Uh, yeah, uh, and he he doesn't. He himself said he doesn't know if he's going to be ready for Week One. Right. So that is the one situation where I can see Lamar Miller making the roster. The, the question that Richard did bring up is what's going on with Damian Harris, like the third round pick. Why isn't he, you know, penciled into more of a role? But I think no matter how you look at it, like James White is going to do his thing. Rex Burkett is going to be involved. And then, you know, at least one of Sonny Michelle or Damian Harris theoretically is going to be in. Brandon Bolden has to get his 20 touches per year. And, uh, well, Bolden opted out, so you can, oh, he, he, does touch it. Oh, he no. opted out. That's so. That's Lamar Miller. He's going to play special teams. Yeah, I'm uh, sure they signed Lamar Miller to, be, to, uh, to block punts. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I I just don't see the value. Like Lamar Miller, the twenty nine year old running back, uh, coming off an ACL tear, uh, coming and even before then he was like a pretty inefficient back with the Texans. Uh, I don't see him becoming kind of a starter. I don't, also don't really see him cutting into any role. Uh, it's just kind of a thing. Like I wonder how much of it is just they need a, like the same thing with McCoy. They need a training camp body. They need a vet who understands you know, football and how the NFL works and stuff like that. And that it might just be like a camp thing. I don't really understand. It could even just be a favor to the agent. With that. The signing doesn't make It doesn't really make sense of football standpoint. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. Like it's just from my perspective, I'm not a Michelle guy. Um, I've watched the dude run for, you know, for years. I just, I, I don't, I'm not a fan. Um, I'm hoping Lamar Miller succeeds uh, with the Patriots. It would help out just because with uh, with Marcus Cannon opting out, uh, it's just another offensive lineman that the Pats aren't going to have um, after dealing with injuries last year. So it's going to hurt. And the offensive line is still better than what the, he was dealing with the Texans. But like you said, it's as of right now, it's not an actionable uh, fantasy move until he actually makes the roster. But I think if he does, there's some potential just because of how injury-prone, inconsistent uh, Sony Michelle has been. But uh, like Blake guys have said, uh, James White's going to be the consistent guy there between 8 and 8.5 points per game, uh, no more, no less. And again, still, still going to be a confusing backfield. Uh, Richard, like you said, with Burkhead and all the, everybody else just muddled in there. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, Lamar Miller takes the team, I think it's I think it's Harris that's the, the odd man out a little bit, unfortunately. Uh, all right. So moving on to some injury news that came out uh Alvin Kamara mentioned uh, this past week that he uh, he tore his knee in a game against the Jags uh, last year. Didn't specify what exactly he tore or what the injury was, but he has been rehabbing all year. Does this worry you? Uh, I guess, um, Kevin, we'll start with you. Does it worry you at all uh, that he didn't have surgery for a tear and has been rehabbing? And is he going to go back to the Kamara of 2018 or is he still going to semi-disappoint like he did last year? I mean, I think I think it's a good thing. I, I, I think surgery is not necessarily always a good thing. I think the body can recover by itself. And it's been, uh, I think he said he tore it in week six. And it has been, I don't know, 11 months since week six, 10 months since week six. So um, 
I'm sure he's been rehabbing it. I'm sure if he came out and said all this stuff about it, then probably going to be okay. Uh, it, did, it does make sense because he definitely wasn't himself in 2019. Um, it doesn't really change my opinion of him in 2019. I, I think I have him as RB4 in 2019 anyway. So, like, it's good to hear that he's healthy. It makes sense that, you know, there's kind of an explanation for his down year. And uh, that's kind of reassuring. But other than that, he's kind of just crazy playing 11 NFL games. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, um, I don't have the stats of how he performed in the first six games does anybody have that before, before I can, you, pull up. can you pull them up yeah because that'd be kind of interesting to know but uh this is the kind of thing this is like kelvin Harmon. like he got injured too but and then he just all of a sudden says that you know he's out for the season like it would have been helpful if we had known a little bit sooner before the scott fishbowl came up because i went and drafted him like he was the last guy I picked up in the you know I thought, ah, oh, here's a good, here's a good, nice grab right at the end of the last player. My last player happened to be Kelvin Harmon, and uh, but Alvin Kamara, I, 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 I have him as RB four, but it's a very nervous kind of RB four. But uh, like, I'm almost tempted to put Cook ahead of him now that Cook is probably going to be in there. So yeah, I, it always kind of makes me nervous when I hear players. Uh, um, coming out with this, you know, this news all of a sudden that you've had a torn ACL and you've been rehabbing all season and not working out, not doing the stuff that you do in, when, in the off season. So it kind of, mm, you know, it, it, it kind of makes me want to push Cook up ahead of him because of this news. I don't well, like it. Well, to answer your question, uh, weeks one to six, he was, according to the Fantasy Post tracker, he was RB10 uh, in half PPR. And then from weeks seven to 17, he was RB19. Uh, he was hurt though from week seven to seventeen, I believe, right. and Latavius Murray took over quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, but Kev, I don't. Did you pull up the the, yeah, the full, uh, full game? Weeks one to six, he averaged 108 yards per game total. I don't know how it's really like this. And then weeks seven to fourteen, or uh, let's see, weeks nine to sixteen, he averaged 85 yards per game. So could have been drop off. Uh, you know, I mean, he wasn't great in, as a rusher his first six games either. He had like a pretty abysmal yards per carry. Uh, do the math there. He had a 4.3 yards per carry. Yeah, everybody claimed uh, uh, he was a bust. You could almost say he was a bust last year. I mean, if you just going by, if his average was what he did, like his RB10, I mean, you would consider that a bust for what he was being taken at. I know. Well, the big thing is he didn't score any touchdowns. Last year he scored six touchdowns. In 2019 he scored 18. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I don't, there's not much else to say right there. Uh-huh. The yardage, all that stuff, the efficiency, whatever. But if he's not scoring touchdowns, then he's just not the guy. No. For sure. Um, I guess last piece of news on the defensive side uh, Jamal Adams traded to the Seahawks. Woohoo. Uh, with the Seahawks defense getting better, does it hurt Russell Wilson and DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett that they're probably going to have to throw a little bit less, uh, Richard? Ah, uh, one player doesn't make. Uh, I think one player doesn't make uh, make all of that much of a difference. I mean, you know, they had Jadavian Clowney, and you know, there was all the hype about him. And yeah, sure, he's um, he's, he's an important. Jamal Adams is pretty important. I think they want to try and uh, go back to the good old days of the Legion of Boom, but. Uh, I, I really don't think it'll it'll change uh, the style of the offense. I mean, um, I do think that um, with the acquisition last year, the surprising everybody passing on DK Metcalf, I think a lot of teams are just, what were we thinking? Why didn't we get this guy? Because he's, um, and A.J. Brown, I can say in the same, we were talking about them earlier too, um, is that uh, the guy's a beast and, and he's, and they're going to use them. I, th- I still, th- I don't think the offense changes a whole lot. I do think that the Seahawks do want to get the running game uh, sorted out, and not they just. I don't know. Every year they have injury problems on the on the front line. I, I'd like to know about. Uh, now I haven't read up on this. It. I think a lot of. Uh, I think what's more important for fantasy, at least on the offensive side, is the Seahawks' offensive line. I mean, they've had. They have had a really. Sort of sub They were a little bit better last year, but their offensive line needs to be just a little bit more. They're not quite an elite unit, and uh, if they if they get to a, an elite unit, they'll they'll be in the playoffs again, maybe again the next year. But uh, but um, Pete Carroll says there's real. Uh, you know, I you got to like Pete Carroll's hype, right? 
he thinks Jamal Adams is like Troy Polamalu. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty high praise. So, if you're getting high, Troy Polamalu, a guy who's... Did you remember how Troy... I used to just, you know, I could care less about fantasy football just to watch... Uh, Roy Troy Polamalu play. I mean, if he's if there are real similarities between Jamal Adams and uh, Troy Polamalu, then uh, I want to see it. All right. And uh, Kevin, any thoughts on the trade? Um, first of all, I think it's a good trade for Seattle because they suck at drafting. So for them to get Jamal Adams, pretty much works. Uh, as far as the offense um, changing because of the defense, like Richard said, it's I don't know how much of a difference adding one defensive player makes. Uh, I don't think their defense is was one player away from being like extraordinary. Um, that being said, I do hope they get Mister Unlimited a few more uh, a few more reps. I hate you know, that. Offense can be unlimited. You know, you gotta you gotta be unlimited. Where did Imagine they, being Russell Wilson? Where did that, that cool come from? Filming that. Oh. Apparently, that that video actually came out like two years ago, and <laughs> no one followed him back then, so no one really cared. Oh man! But now it's, I I think I'm just gonna draw. I say it every day now. I think to myself in the mirror when I wake up. <laughs> unlimited. Unlimited. You gotta be unlimited. How many? Balls is DK Metcalf going to catch this year? Unlimited. Not if Josh Gordon signs, which the Seahawks have said they want to do. Oh, we going to talk about him, yes. Unlimited ball. Unlimited. Beautiful segue, Richard. Come on. And, well, ball. yeah, it's not only him, but, uh, but, uh, but they're even looking at Antonio Brown, too. Everybody should be looking at Antonio Brown, except the Steelers and the Raiders. Yeah. And even, Steelers, but... even, even Baltimore have expressed. I hope Baltimore. That would be disgusting. We need him. That would just be unfair. Yeah, it would be unfair because then you won't you won't have a Josh Gordon and you won't have an Antonio Brown. Hey, Jonathan, hear me out, okay? So, uh, Antonio Brown got suspended eight weeks, right? Guess who the Ravens play week nine? Uh, I'm going to say it's the Pats. Yeah. Yeah. Revenge game. Yeah. Mark it down. Antonio Brown rocking 84. In I, the purple. I can't think of a reason why it would be a revenge game. Because he did come in on like two days after two days after a signing, we we force fed him like thirteen targets against the Dolphins. But yeah, you, exactly. you know, it's it'd be it's honestly it'd just be funny just watching Antonio Brown play against the Steelers. That would just be top level comedy. Yes, that needs to happen. That needs to happen. Just like Brown happen. catches the ball on the Steelers sideline, spins the ball, and says something to Mike Tomlin. Uh, nothing would make me happier. It would be very Antonio Brown just to catch it, throw it at Mike Tomlin, and then walk off the field. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, I'll get it. I'll, I'll excited for the season. Um, that's pretty much it for news that happened over the past couple of weeks uh, that I can think of anyways. Uh, only other things that I can remember off the top of my head is, again, Antonio Brown said he was retiring, but that was 22 days ago. And, of course, he's already said he's trying to come back. Um, yeah. Other than that, just there's been a list of opt-outs uh, after the deadline last Thursday. Uh, biggest one that we've, well, for me anyways, I've already touched on is uh, Marcus Cannon, uh, Patriots offensive lineman opting out. Uh, their offensive line is a huge strength that without Cannon, uh, one of the veterans could could struggle this year, but they're getting David Andrews back, so it might not be bad. Um, another I'm concerned about is Nate Solder uh, for the Giants. He opted out, and of course, New York's That's line huge, is already actually. bad. Sorry, Richard? That's huge, actually. Yeah, the, the Giants O line was already bad, and without Solder, uh, it could be worse. Is there any concern for Saquon uh, going second overall, or is he, everybody still sticking with him because he's overcome a bad line before? Uh, well, that's what that's the thing, isn't it? Uh, if you're a good enough running back, uh, you can overcome a bad uh, offensive line, and and many running backs have in the past. Uh, uh, lots of uh, running backs have uh, have played behind uh, subpar offensive lines and uh like look at uh, marshawn lynch um um the after after unger left um he still he still put up the numbers for i think he was after unger left for the saints i think uh we, unger was the center i think the center is the i think the center for a running back the center is kind of the key guy more than anything else so uh it's really if you've got a good center um that's he's kind of the guiding force of the of the of the uh, of the flow in in uh, uh, in sweeps and stuff. He's sort of like the main guy. He's sort of the captain of the of the line. So uh, so I think I think the center is is really the key is is more the key guy. I'd be concerned about. So right. and uh, Kev on the other the other side of this, how does this uh, affect Daniel Jones? Uh, that's where you you worry a little bit more. Uh, Daniel Jones is talented. I mean he he can make some throws, but he's he's takes a lot of sacks. 
um, a lot of sacks. And it, it doesn't help a young quarterback when your best pass blocker is, is just not going to be on the field. Um, I don't really think it would make me like decrease Daniel Jones like draft stock too much because I don't think I I probably had him like quarterback 14 15 something like that I can't really imagine him being much lower much higher than that but uh yeah I mean it's definitely worrisome I just don't know how much it really impacts his fantasy value because if he takes sacks like do I care that he takes sacks I don't know about that I just care that did you draft him as Scott Fishbowl of course not what do I look like do I look like (laughs) if you did that's when that's when you get in trouble on you know who I've got I've got the (laughs) you've got Lamar and Cam you have the best duo Mm. Yeah, I was just trying to, you know, what else do I need? Why would I want Daniel Jones? Uh, I see one guy on this list I drafted in Scott Fishbone. It's very unhappy Devin about Fun- it. Devin Funchess, yeah. And Kelvin Harmon. Uh, well, Devin Funchess, uh, since we just mentioned him, move on to him. Uh, I guess at this point, I'm assuming he will be a former Packers wide receiver after the year. Um, is Alan Lazard a legitimate like wide receiver three now? without with just no options behind Devontae Adams? Yes, he is. Yes. But I would also say that uh, at the end of your draft, uh, scoop up Jay Sternberger. Because uh, he's the only, because um, Lazard's kind of one of the littler guys, you know. Devin Funches was kind of like, was the big catcher, uh, you know, the big pass catcher. And the only big ca- pass catcher left is Jay Sternberger, uh, who actually wears the same number as uh, another famous Packer, who's no longer with the team. So, uh, yeah. number 87. Oh, Jordy Nelson. Okay. Jordy Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that, but what's in a number? But I mean, uh, Jay Sternberger. Um, he's he's a dark horse. He scored a he scored a touchdown in the conference final, but he didn't do anything else during the uh, season. But uh, eh, he's a guy to pick up at the end of your draft, I think, for the uh, for the guy for the big man catching passes because uh, Stephen Funches was kind of like going to be their big uh, the big man receiver. Because all the other guys are, you know, they're all kind of, they're all littler, you know, the little little guys that just, you know, for speed, right? So that's what Lazard is, a speed, and Javante Adams, of course. So, and then you got, you know, the other uh, guys that just haven't quite worked out. Geronimo Allison, of course, is no longer the team, but um, Equinonia St. Brown and uh, another guy with another long name. Escapes, Marquez you know, Valdez-Scantling? Scantling, yeah. All these guys with double-barreled names. <laughs> And they have to be long, too, you know. But anyways, they're not working out too well. So, anyways, Jay Sternberger. People out there, people out there, Jay Sternberger. Pick him up at the end of your draft. Throw a dart. It's in my dart and, throw uh, article. Kev, moving on to the, uh, I guess, the next biggest fantasy-affected opt-out. Uh, both Albert Wilson and Alan Hearns, uh, Dolphins receivers, opted out of the season. Uh, how much does this help Devontae Parker, Preston Williams, or and Mike Isecki? Is there one in particular that's going to benefit most uh, from the other two receivers opting out? Yeah, I think the one who's going to benefit the most, I'm glad you asked it that way because obviously they all benefit, but Preston Williams is the guy who's going to just immediately going to have to step into those targets. Um, he's a guy who was pretty impressive last preseason and the first couple of games of the season before he got hurt, and then Devontae Parker just became like a target hog. But I think Preston Williams is uh, a guy that you can basically get for free at that tail end of your drafts, and he's going to probably play like 85% of the snaps, probably get close to 100 targets. Um, I think, I don't know if this is a bold prediction, but I think Parker and Williams are going to be a lot closer uh, fantasy-wise this year than like their ADP suggests. Is there any concern that the Dolphins have mentioned that they're going to bring Williams along slowly and that they're unsure of his re- uh, his week one status right now? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that we're going to figure out a lot um, once camp really starts up because I, I think everything is just kind of up in the air with injuries. I don't think uh, with the whole COVID situation, I don't think even teams have a good grasp on what's going on with their guys' bodies. And I think we'll get a better idea of what's happening specifically like once camp starts. So for now, I'm kind of just putting all that aside and just kind of assuming everyone is going to be healthy. But if we heard, hear more about how like Williams is like not coming along or something like that, then of course, yeah, you can out. But for now, I'm kind of just kind of just trying to ignore the injury talk because I don't think it's that informational. And uh, Richard, moving on to the I guess the other part of that equation or the other possible beneficiary of that equation, Mike Gusecki, the tight end, uh, not the most, not the most famous pass blocker uh, or run blocker for that matter, mostly plays out of the slot. How much do you think he benefits from, uh, from the opt-outs? You know, I really have uh, my, my patience has run thin on Gusecki. Um, I, I really don't think there's, I really don't think there's much to, uh, I don't think there's, I don't think there's really, he just seems like a guy, uh, now. He doesn't seem like, uh, you know, of course he could 
he could change and and uh, you know wait. And he's one of these one of these tight ends you keep waiting for a breakout, but it doesn't seem to to happen. And I just don't think the Dolphins system uh, works for a guy like Gasecki. And and I would even say that about a lot of other teams who have, who have great uh, like like uh, for instance, like we all just thought about O.J. Howard in the same way I did. I fell right into the trap of O.J. Howard last year. I thought, hey, and but of course. I didn't realize, and of course, it, it was it, it was right in front of your face about how Arians uh, works with tight ends. Um, I think he might make an exception in the case of uh, Gronk, but um, Gasecki, I, I really think he's um, his uh, where he's being drafted is actually actually quite appropriate. I have him as I will get this up. Give me. Uh, I have Mike Gasecki at um, tight end thirteen. And I even think that's a little high. I think it would, I think I'm I'm gonna actually put Noah Fant in front of him. Uh, you just change your rankings on the fly there. I just changed my rankings on the fly. In fact, I might even put John. <laughs> o- I'm tempted to put John o- Smith ahead of him, but I won't. Uh, well, yeah, I will. What the heck? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not big on Mike Gusecki. I'm not. Yeah. I think on for me, I think Gusecki. He finished the entirety of last season as tight end eleven, and toward the end of the season, between weeks twelve and seventeen, he was te five. Uh, granted, there were a lot of injuries uh, for the Dolphins, and he was getting uh, a significant amount of targets uh, toward the end of the year. But sort of the same situation here. At worst, he's the number three target on the team uh, for a team that's probably gonna have to throw quite a bit uh, with their defense, regardless of how well they play down the year uh, down the stretch. I think they're gonna have to throw quite a bit. And at uh, Fantasy Pros right now, he's tight end thirteen. Richard, I think for you, he's moved on tight end fifteen now. Yeah, he's down at. <laughs> Uh, what what is uh, I mean, he at? I think at that point as a you know the number three target on a on a probably what will be a pass first team I think that's pretty pretty good value and a good chance for for some value there yeah i I'm actually kind of interested to see uh how Jordan Howard plays on the team when it, when it comes to the dolphins I'm, I'm kind of interested to see like if how much uh, Jordan Howard has in the tank um the Jordan I, Howard thing is going to be the same as it always is. Everybody's going to count him out and then he's going to he's going to take carries from everybody's favorite running back Matt Breida. That's just how it's going to work. Yeah. Quite he's awesome. going to take half the carries. He's going to score all the touchdowns and everybody that drafted Matt Breida is going to be mad. That's that's how that's going to go. Kevin, what do you say? You're a Jordan Howard fan? Oh yeah. Great. I love Jordan Howard this year. I mean, it's exactly what you know you're going to get 65 yards and maybe a touchdown. Yep. Every game without so, 80 yards and maybe a touchdown. Yeah, another but, one of those. Another one of those like running backs that comes in and spoils your fantasy guy. You think it's going to happen? I will step in and say I am a Jaseki guy though. I have him ranked as tight end eleven. Yeah, I think the um, target share it, it is it does it for me. But I mean, for me, it's like anything under the anything besides the top four tight ends. Like I I just don't care, and I'm willing to take sh- shots on like ultra athletes. Like this guy is 97 percent spark spark score. A five four five four forty at six six two fifty is insane. <laughs> like that, this is incredible. Um, he's twenty, like twenty two, twenty three, something like that. Like the offense is decent. Like that's the, that's like exactly what you're looking for in breakout tight end. Yeah, you are, but I, I don't know. It's 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 kind of like it's it's he's a Hunter Henry type of situation almost. Like Hunter yeah, Henry. I mean, I, like would I rather have Mike Jacecki a little bit lower, or would I rather have Austin? Like I'd rather just have Jacecki. Would I rather have Jacecki or Gronk? I'd probably just rather have Jacecki. Huh. Guys, you know me. It's all about the upside. It doesn't. I don't really care about if you get forty yards, or whatever. Like I'm looking for the next tight end four. Yeah, the next yeah. Darren Waller. The top, the top three tight ends to me are bullet, but tight well, end four. Can be up for grabs. I, I think a guy, a guy is too. Not bulletproof for you. Who? Hertz. Hertz is not bulletproof for me. I don't really. Think. Yeah, he's like I, the number one guy. Nah, Hertz is always Hertz is is volume dependent, and I think that offense is is gonna they're gonna give Goddard more of a shot. I think Jalen Rager is really going to surprise some people. Uh, Miles Sanders is going to carry that offensively. I think they're going to try and take the ball out of Carson. What do you guys think of Irv Smith? He was in my dart throw article. I think he's a good yeah, dart throw. I, I don't really, like, I just don't see the volume of Minnesota. Yeah, it's like, Kevin, I totally agree. I think it's going to be Dalvin Cook and Alex Madison uh, as much as they possibly can. Yeah. And Smith is going to, he's not going to get enough targets to be a true breakout. Smith is uh, talented enough. It's just in that offense, like even Kyle Rudolph these last couple of years, like he might get you six or seven touchdowns, but you can't really depend on him to eat. No, Jefferson's, uh, I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah, Jefferson, 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 Jefferson should be going higher, I think. Anyways, I digress. It's, it's the fear of rookie wide receivers. That's the, uh, the, yeah. 
the determining factor there. Yeah. Uh, well, we have a few other opt-outs. Not sure if you guys want to talk about those ones. They're pretty minor in terms of fantasy. Uh, the only one that might affect is the pair of Chiefs offensive linemen, uh, Duvernay Tardif and Lucas Niang. Uh, does it affect the Chiefs offense at all, or does this just mean Mahomes is going to throw it faster? Yeah, I just put my trust in Andy Reid. They'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah, uh, they will. They'll figure it out. I'm not, no, not, not too concerned about uh, line guys. The only guys that I, uh, I, when it comes to offensive line, it's the center for me. Uh, for center opts out, then oh, yeah, it's big trouble. So, and I guess the only other offensive one, real offensive one, we have uh, Richard. You mentioned him earlier. Jonathan Allison opted out as well. Uh, Lions receiver. Does Danny Amendola stick around for another year of a uh, couple of good games? He gets added by the masses, and then he uh, kind of blows it for the next six weeks. Yeah, you spelled it out right there. That's exactly <laughs> what you get. <laughs> That's exactly what you get with Danny Amendola. Yeah, uh, Jerome Allison. Uh, whether he was, whether he opted in or not, um, this is this is all about Marvin Jones and uh, and uh, Baby Tron. You know, so. Baby Tron. I forgot that was that his nickname. Apparently. Oh. That's I don't like that. You don't like Baby Tron? I don't like that at all. Calvin Johnson was a, was at a, a different level of wide receiver. Like Kenny Galladay is not even in his stratosphere. Don't hey, like that. He, at all. He's my WR seven this year. Yeah, but Calvin Johnson would be unquestioned WR one. There's no like no. That's I hence don't like the that. name. Be, hence I'll, the I'll, name I'll, Baby I'll, Tron. I'll, I'll, He's not quite. He's not a mega. He's a baby Tron. Yeah, but no, you, you can't compare the two. Sorry, Kev, if he was playing right now, he would be my wide receiver seven. Yeah, like it's and he he's what thirty five now, thirty six. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's he's he's another level. Yeah, instead he's just retired and smoking weed every day. <laughs> well, at least he's happy and healthy. Chris Borland took the right route too. Yeah, I want to ask you guys a question. Joe Burrow, what? Um, you think he comes out and lights it up? And uh, his first year with the Bengals, anybody? Yeah, I mean, he has the weapons and the talent to do so. Um, I, I'm, I'm, a, he, he, he's a good player. I assume he's going to come out and do pretty well. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting some growing pains. I, I never expect uh, rookie QBs to come out and light the world on fire right away. But he's been put in a good position with the players around him to succeed. Uh, it's a matter of whether or not you know Zach Taylor can prove himself to be a. Uh, a good NFL quarterback to kind of design that system around his, uh, or sorry, NFL coach design his system around a, uh, a new rookie quarterback. And you know, it's funny when it comes to Joe Burrow, I just cannot think of him as that, like, I can't, like, here's the national championship quarterback. He just doesn't seem like the same guy somehow in the Bengals. It doesn't seem like, mm, you know, it doesn't seem like uh, he's, he's a, a different quarterback. He's going to be a different quarterback in the pros, I think. Not the same. Uh, he'll try, as all college players do, but they always find out the hard way. And then, like Daniel Jones, he started off good, and then defense is okay. We, we know how to we know how to trick this guy. We know how to show this guy things that that he won't be prepared for. It takes so long for reading defenses, man. It's it's a talent as what as much as being having a talented arm. I think. I think reading defenses is is very underrated for quarter because you look at you look at Brady. You know why Brady has lasted so long? He reads defenses. He knows. He's seen everything. He knows exactly what to do. Uh, he knows all the tricks of the trade when it comes to reading defenses, man. And it's not just it's it's not just these experience, but it's it's a, it's this kind of a skill, like a like a, a talent for it. So yeah, Tom Brady also makes sure to keep himself super healthy by eating uh, avocado ice cream every day. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kev, uh, Joe Burrow's your division rival. Uh, you should probably chime in on this one. No, I think I think he's going to come out and surprise some people for fantasy purposes. Uh, that, like you said, the offense is geared towards him having success, and uh, most importantly, that defense stinks. So he's going to have the ball a ton. Uh, I think he's like. I mean, the thing about Burrow is like he's a really old rookie. Like he's older than Lamar Jackson, so like he's had time to you know study offense and be in quarterback rooms and all that stuff. He's not going to be uh, like a Josh Rosen type. He's just not prepared. Like for all, from all accounts, like Burrow has all the traits I'd kind of want in a quarterback. It is like accuracy, ultra competitiveness, and like understanding of the game, which is I think that translates all pretty well. Yeah, that's fair. All right, uh, perfect. And I guess we'll end with that. We're bordering on an hour now. I don't have my timer up. Yeah, but, no uh, worries. We'll do it for our uh, our first show of the 2020 season. Uh, Richard, Kevin, thanks for coming, and uh, we'll do this again next week. Yeah, we should. We yeah, shall. That too. We'll that do too. a season preview at some point. Pick Super Bowl winners and uh, Trevor Lawrence draft uh, draft three stakes winners too. Oh no! That will. <laughs> right, everybody, thanks for listening to the Fantasy Edge. We'll uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah.